Hi everybody, it's Professor Michelson here. This is Criminology Lecture on Social Structural Theories of Crime. Uh, we've already talked about classical and neoclassical theories of crime that focus on the question of choice, biological theories of crime, which look at people's physiological makeup and how that contributes to criminal behavior, and then psychological theories of crime, everywhere from Freud to schizophrenia. So, Today we're starting to talk about the first set of what are called mainstream sociological theories of crime. Um, we're going to be spending uh, three lectures talking about sociological theories of crime. Uh, sociological theories of crime are split into two categories. The first is mainstream, which I just talked about. Uh, these are sociological theories that uh, focus on the criminal. Uh, why does a particular criminal, or why, why does a type of criminal commit a type of crime? Remember, as sociologists, we're not looking at individual people. That's more a psychological perspective. Sociologists look at people on a grander scale. Um, so some of the social, structural, uh, sociological mainstream theories that we're going to be talking about uh, are anomie theories of uh, normlessness, for example, that, that come from uh, Durkheim, Emil Durkheim, who was a, um, a French sociologist, one of the original sociologists. Um, we're going to be talking about social process theories, social control theories, all sorts of different th sociological theories of crime are the most um, prevalent today. So mainstream theories of crime that focus on why people commit crime. Sociological critical theories, we're going to be talking about in a couple of lectures, which focus less on the crime, not at all, frankly, on the criminal, and more on why certain things are made criminal in a society. So instead of looking at why people commit crimes and how, for example, uh, poverty or um, their friends or um, their feelings affect whether or not they commit crime. Sociological critical theories say who made something a crime and why did they make it a crime and what function does it serve to make something a crime. Okay? But we'll talk about that later in a couple of lectures. So today we're going to talk about uh, social structural theories of crime. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, social disorganization theory, strain theory, and uh, delinquent subcultures theories. Uh, you'll see that there's a PowerPoint up on Blackboard, and it'll follow along with your book a little bit. As always, my lecture only supplements your reading. It's only to sort of help give some color to your reading. Uh, it should not substitute your reading, so make sure you're going to the book. So structure-based theories really look at um, economics and crime. How do culture and social class and values and community stability, all of these different things, um, affect criminal behavior? Um, the idea behind um, social disorganization theory came from what's called the Chicago School, which is um, sort of the birthplace of sociology in the United States in Chicago, University of Chicago in the 1930s. Um, what the, the originators of social disorganization theory noticed was that the inner cities were places where a lot of crime was happening. Um, they noticed that this was happening within the context of a lot of social change, uh, industrialization, urbanization, uh, lots of immigration happening, and, and noticed that they were from Chicago. They were using Chicago really as a, um, a laboratory, if you will. Uh, what they theorized was that all of these rapid changes with the immigration and people moving and changing and immigration, I said immigration, immigration, urbanization, industrialization, that that ended up weakening the, the uh, formal and informal social controls in that neighborhood. So uh, weakening the police uh, as a measure of formal social control, but also the... Um, uh, the local woman who sits, uh, sits on the stoop, right, and, and her control over the sort of order in the neighborhood. Um, that would lead to um, the formation of gangs, for example, um, again, feeding off of that lack of structure. Uh, and then over time, those um, 
that crime would be transmitted uh, to new people. Now, their focus was what's was on um, what they called concentric zones. Um, they were really looking at um, Chicago as sort of an ecosystem, much like a zoologist would look at um, a, a, a biome, you know, like plants and animals. Um, they were looking at Chicago and, and generalizing two cities um, as a as a place, um, and the the central business district was the center of the city. Think about that as where your um, office buildings are and people are coming in and out all the time. Zone one was where they said um, that central business district was. Zone two, they called the zone of transition. They believed that that was where most people came when they immigrated first to the city. Um, there were uh, the houses and the infrastructure was sort of dilapidated. Um, they, there was not a lot of, it's really it's about stability. Okay, Zone 2 was about a lack of stability, no, no regular neighbors, no regular um, anything that you could depend on, just people moving and moving and moving. And they suggested that Zone 2 was where the most crime was. As the zones go out, Zone 3, Zone 4, Zone 5, for example, they suggested that crime would go, that crime went down, that it did go down. That even as people moved in and out of Zone 2 and Zone 3 and Zone 4, that it was about the place, not about the people, right? I mean, the different types of immigrants that were coming through Chicago that, you know, ha has changed over time. It wasn't about the Polish people coming in or, you know, black people coming in or Hispanic people coming in or whoever it was. It was about the place and the lack of, of constancy in the place. Um, there are a few problems as you might imagine, I'd like you to sort of think about what problems there might be with this concentric zone model. Um, certainly, some types of crime are quite common uh, in such a zone of transition. Uh, we know that uh, transitional areas do have, you know, a solid amount of violent crime, property crime. The problem is, is, well, there's a number of problems, but one of the problems with social disorganization theory that I'd like you to pay attention to is the fact that it does not account for crimes by people who are out in the in, uh, other zones. And what we know is that it's not only poor immigrants that are smoking weed, for example. It's not only poor immigrants that are stealing things. They may have different methods. White collar crime, for example, is incredibly common in people who live in the outer concentric zones. Domestic violence uh, doesn't only happen with people who are uh, poor and living in that transitional zone. So the social disorganization theory really does fail to explain why certain types of crimes happen in those other areas. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. So think about uh, turns you a little bit into a critical theorist if you're starting to question different types of crimes and how they're um, enforced and focused on. Um, but that's social disorganization. That's what I wanted to focus on for social disorganization theory. Now, um, there were a few theories that came out of social disorganization theory, and certainly it was, it was a theory that was uh, meant to be practically applied. The Chicago Area Project um, worked to um, fix those problems of social disorganization. And Broken Windows theory that was um, uh, developed by Wilson and Kelling in the 1980s um, also comes a little bit from the social disorganization tradition. Broken Windows theory, um, the core of it is that if there are um, signs of um, disrepair, such as broken windows in an area, people uh, will believe that no one cares and that no one is watching and it will therefore breed more um, uh, cr well, crime, I guess broken windows aren't crime all the time, obviously, but um, 
that it'll breed crime because people think that no one's watching and that nobody cares. Um, and that broken windows theory certainly spawned all sorts of different law enforcement techniques over the years. Uh, Rudy Giuliani um, was a, a, quite focused on um, broken windows theory and the implications of that for law enforcement. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I'd like to move on to strain theory. Strain theory, frankly, is one of my favorites. Uh, maybe my absolute favorite criminological theory right now. I think it works really, really well. Uh, what I'd like you to, to um, what I'd like you to, to focus on is uh, not just where it came from. Certainly the genesis of strain theory is uh, from Emil Durkheim, as I said, uh, a French uh, philosopher, uh, sociologist, um, who came up with the concept of anomie, uh, coming from the French uh, nom normlessness, namelessness, um, that rapid change can um, lead to uh, of feelings of normlessness, which can lead to, well, he often said suicide. He had a book called Suicide. Anyway, um, strain theory was was um, started in the 1930s by a guy named Robert Merton. I always remembered uh, Merton's name from the M-E, means ends. Uh, his idea was that um, everybody has the same goals in a particular society, the ends. Everybody wants the same things. Um, but not everybody has the same means to achieve that. Poverty, for example, um, can make it so that people who want a big screen TV can't get a big screen D TV. And he said that people adapt to that um, difference between the means and the ends in different ways. Uh, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and rebellion. This is all in your book. Innovation is where you should focus as a criminologist. Innovation, one of the possible innovations is criminal behavior. That if you don't have any money and you want a big screen TV, you might steal, you might innovate a way to get money uh, to get that big screen TV. Now, Merton Merton started strain theory, certainly, um, but then somebody named Robert Agnew came along and uh, created something called general strain theory, which expands on Merton's original idea. Agnew said it's not only about money. Um, there are all sorts of different sources of strain. Certainly there's a failure to achieve your goals, but people also, or some, something might be getting in the way of your goals. Um, removal of positive stimuli, presentation of negative stimuli, all of these different things are sources of strain that lead to negative affective states, negative mood states like anger or frustration. Um, that leads to strain and therefore to criminal behavior. So it's not just about not having enough money, it might also be about um, being worried that someone is going to steal your girlfriend um, or uh, losing your job. Um, I'm sure you could think of all sorts of different sources of strain that lead to negative emotions that then in turn lead to, may lead to criminal behavior. So um, Robert Agnew's uh, expansion of strain, of, of Merton's original strain theory to general strain theory is an incredibly popular theory these days, is used a lot in, in um, uh, sociological research on crime. Now subcultural delinquency theories um, are really about how um, people choose to create their own subcultures um, in reaction to um, not feeling a part of uh, mainstream uh, cultures. There's all sorts of people who talk about this, all sorts of theorists who talk about this. Uh, Miller's focal, uh, sorry, focal concern theory um, is one of the more popular ones. I'd like you to think about whether um, you recognize any of the um, uh, values uh, talked about by Miller. He talks about trouble, toughness, smartness, excitement, fate, and autonomy. Um, I'd like you to think about how those values, different from mainstream cultural values, might uh, have existed in uh, your high school, for example, and how they might be related to criminal behavior. Um, uh, 
and how not just um, not just in your high school, for example, but also um, in athletic teams or here in college or um, where you see them in the mass media, for example. And there's a discussion board up on Blackboard where you can talk about where focal con uh, concerns exist in your life. So that's my, that's where I want you to sort of have a little bit of extra color on your reading. Um, if you, uh, have any questions, remember you can always, always email me. Uh, make sure you're keeping up with the discussion boards. And I'll see you next lecture uh, where we're going to continue talking about mainstream sociological theories of crime. Okay? Take care, everybody.